Okay, hello everybody again. Welcome to Geocoding for Legislative Advocacy. My name is Kyla Hunt and I'm the facil facilitator today. I'm the Webinar Program Manager here at TechSoup Global. And with me today are Abby Fritz and Thomas Taylor. And Abby, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, thank you Kyla. My name is Abby Fritz. Um, I'm a Project Manager for Xavier's Political Elections and Redistricting Teams. I, I work for Xavier, which, which is a software development company based in Philadelphia. Um, and again, my team, all of our projects focus on politics, elections, and redistricting. Okay, thank you, Abby. And Thomas, can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Thomas Taylor. I'm Director of IT with the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance. And uh, we use Azavia for a couple of different tasks that I'll be talking about uh, later in the presentation after a Abby gives a thorough overview of Cicero and the API. Awesome. Thank you so much. And just really quickly before Abby goes, goes ahead and gets started, I did want to send you a bit.ly link for the Cicero Legislative Information API, which is available through the TechSoup stock page, and that is bit.ly forward slash Cicero API. And so if you are interested in learning about the API that we will be learning about today, or looking more into getting access to it, that is where you would want to go. And I will also be sending that bit.ly out to everybody following the session. So with that, um, just a little bit about what we are going to be talking about today. Again, Abby is going to be talking about Cicero and Xavier and how you can use that for geocoding um, and uh, legislative matching. And then Thomas is going to go into a little bit of a case study um, for the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance. So Abby, take it away. Great. Thank you so much. So I'm going to get started by um, talking a little bit about what Xavier actually does. Um, we are a, like I said before, we are a geospatial software design company based in Philadelphia, PA. Um, we're a small shop, about 26 people. We specialize in web-based geographic analysis and modeling applications. Our, our clients range from um, government, local, state, and federal governments, as well as a lot of nonprofits um, and academic clients. Um, we primarily develop geographic web and mobile software um, and offer geospatial analysis services. Our, our main goal is to enhance decision making, the decision making processes um, that a lot of these entities face and uh, help them solve complex, interesting, and novel problems. Um, our work is not domain specific and includes um, things such as political advocacy, land conservation, um, cultural resources, urban um, policy, uh, urban policy analysis, um, etc. We work um, with a number of sectors um, where we work with social and human services, arts and humanities, um, elections and politics, etc. Our work with nonprofits um, is pretty extensive and ranges both from doing actual analysis of data that a lot of nonprofits have in-house but don't really have any way of um, analyzing or creating extens getting ex extensive information from their data. Um, we, so we do one-off projects. We've done a number of projects with local um, advocacy groups, arts organizations, um, as well as with the local government um, to try to get a, as much as, as they can out of their data. We did also work with a lot of entities to create web-based applications, web and mobile-based applications. You see a few examples on your screen here, and I will be getting into that a little bit more um, as it relates to the Cicero API. So what does Cicero do? Um, I, I don't know how many of you have signed up for a Cicero account or have read a bit about Cicero on the TechSoup website, um, but I'm going to go through a couple of the key points of the Cicero API. Um, the first thing that the Cicero API does is geocoding. Um, basically, you are passing your addresses in your address database to, through the API, and I'll explain more specifically what an API actually is in a bit. Um, and you pass your address to us. We have a geocoding service um, that stamps each address and assigns it with a latitude-longitude coordinate point. So these are map points that specifically describe where a particular address is on the map, and we stamp your address with that coordinate point. 
Now that coordinate point allows us to do then the next step, which is matching that coordinate point, very specific point, to a legislative districts. Um, the CISRO service is unique um, in the world of district matching services in that we do use address level geocoding. Address level geocoding is as specific and precise as you can get. Um, a lot of services use zip code matching, which basically means that they're matching the zip code from a particular address to the zip code, all of the zip codes um, in a particular legislative district. Um, this can get a little bit messy, and I'll explain that in a bit, because um, a number of zip codes aren't actually all contained within, uh, neatly contained within a legislative district. So if you can match a specific point to a legislative district, that will get, get you much more accurate results. The next thing the CISRO API does is provide you with, if you're interested, um, again, all of the services that the API provides you with are optional. So if you're interested in displaying a boundary map on maybe your website or internally in um, an internal application that you have in your, in your organization, you can do that by requesting a map um, for each of the districts that are returned to you. This map is a, actually a very simple JPEG image that is geotagged to a map, and you can overlay that over Google Maps um, or Bing Maps or any of the other widely available web map um, applications that are, uh, that are available. Another aspect of CICERO that I'd like to talk about is the actual data that we have in our database. The CICERO collection of data is huge, and it's growing. We are continuing to grow it. Um, every day. We are adding additional locales, um, new types of information. Um, the first major, major type of information that you can access with the API and stamp all of your addresses with is legislative districts. Um, legis we have a huge collection of spatial or map-based data um, that describe a legislative district boundary. We have uh, local legislative boundaries for 100 of the most populous cities in the U.S. Um, so that includes city councils and um, a couple county councils as well, um, supervisorial districts, these kinds of things. We have full coverage for states in Canada, uh, state legislative districts in Canada, as well as the United States um, and Australia. Um, we have federal level data for the, for the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the U.K. Um, and this is uh, continuing to grow. Like I said, we, have, we entertain requests from people for specific information. We will often have nonprofits that call us and say that they are doing a particular action um, in a locale that we don't have information for currently. Um, and we can, if the data is available, we can add it to the API um, to be used for a lookup. Um, we have elected official information as well. So anytime you make a request and you get your districts back that match your addresses that you've submitted, you will be able to also then access the elected official contact information for each of those districts. So if you are requesting local, state, and federal data, um, we will pass you back the district IDs. And we, will, we can also, with a second call to the database, can also pass you back um, all of the elected official information, including the name, um, primary and secondary contact information, phone, fax, um, email address, URL, and you can use all of this information in whatever way you would like. If you want to populate a database that you have, um, or if you want to do a call to action campaign, for example, this information is really valuable for your end user um, to be able to put them in touch with the appropriate people. We also have election data. Um, our election data database is actually both historic. We're collecting historic election data as well as, um, as well as future events. So we collect um, election events that describe the date, um, wh what the election is actually for, where it is located, um, with appropriate URLs that describe the election event, official URLs um, for that particular election. This information is accessible um, by all of you. It also really helps uh, guide us in keeping our database up to date. Um, we have reminders that come up with all of the upcoming election events, and it, this helps our team um, stay up to date, enter people as they are elected into office, and switch them over um, to be accessible to you as they take office. 
we also have a data set that, that uh, not a lot of people are aware of, and we would love to make more people aware of it as it is an extremely useful um, set of data. We have non-legislative district data. Now, non-legislative district data um, is basically is, requires the same type of information that legislative district data does. We gather um, map files or boundary files for non-legislative data, such as watershed boundaries. Um, so we have watersheds for the entire United States. Um, we also have counties, school districts, and police districts for several cities in the U.S. And um, really anything that has, a dist any district that has boundary information available, it can be plugged into the Cicero API on our end and made available for district matching um, and address lookups for the end user. Um, we've had a couple people um, very interested in the watershed boundary data and doing district matching and look, uh, address lookups against watershed data because of actions they want to take. So if they are advocating for particular environmental action um, in, a, in a specific watershed, they can figure out which of their constituents or followers or people that they're reaching out to are actually located in that watershed and then target their advocacy um, and their, their political actions um, around that information. So this non-legislative data is, is very useful in kind of segmenting your constituent database into, into categories of people that you would like to reach out for, to for particular actions. The next, uh, next section I'd like to talk to you about is um, how Throw is different um, from other district matching services. There are, in fact, quite a few district matching elected official lookup tools available, um, whether through an API or through kind of a web-based piece of software. Um, uh, several of the major CRMs that are available um, that you may be using have certain comp components of um, district matching and, and geocoding available. Um, I'm going to talk through a couple of the pieces that, that kind of differentiate Cicero from these other services and explain a little bit more about um, what, what the strengths of Cicero are. Um, the first big one, like I had mentioned before, is address versus zip code district matching. As you can see on this slide, um, we took a district in, in Philadelphia and are showing you that, the, that District 181 and 175 are neighboring districts. Um, when you're looking at, when you're doing um, geocoding based on a zip code, you're finding, you're basically assigning the coordinate point to the center of that zip code. Now, if that zip code doesn't, um, is split um, by a particular district, and as you can see, the zip code 19123 actually falls in two districts, your, the, it will try to match based on that one point, um, but that may be the wrong district. So that, you can, as you can see, the, the zip code centroid is in 181, but the, um, but the actual district is 175. So um, again, we, this, we are one of the very few people who are conducting our district matching um, based on address alone. A second set of points about the differences of Cicero um, and other, other uh, district matching tools, the accuracy and reliability. We are a geospatial software design company, um, and actually Cicero um, is, is kind of an uh, is unusual project for us. Um, we don't often, we don't often um, create our own data or, or manage our own data. Um, we are using nonprofits or other organizations' data and analyzing it. Um, the Cicero API, however, has, we have gathered a lot of legislative data for many of our elections projects. Um, which was kind of the starting point for us. Um, we have a team of spatial analysts, GIS an analysts actually, and political data specialists now in-house, and that team continues to grow. Um, and they are continually updating the database um, with new information. Like I said, we track our general and special elections around the world and add, add new information, update elected officials based on those elections. Um, so we have a dedicated team for the Cicero API and the, and, um, the data structure behind it. Um, we are, the third piece is actually a very timely piece. Um, and if any of you have been following the redistricting process, you'll know that it can be a very, a very um, contentious process and can last a fairly long time. Each state after the decennial census um, takes the new population counts 
and has to apply that to their legislative districts and come up with new redistricted legislative district plans um, to, to accommodate the shifts in population. Um, this does not happen in one neat um, kind of batch process. It happens piecemeal across the United States at the local, state, um, and congressional level um, kind of throughout the, the year following the census release of the data. Um, we have, a lot of people have come to us saying, well, I can look up the current boundaries and I can match my constituents to current boundaries, but what do I do about future actions? Um, I am doing an action that I know is timed pretty closely to, um, to the new legislative boundaries taking effect, and I would like to know ahead of time what districts my constituents will, be, um, will belong to. We have, um, in order to meet those needs, we have actually developed a second call, um, a second type of data that you can look up. So we have current boundary data, um, legislative boundaries currently in use, and then we have a second call, 2010 data call, that um, is basically all of the legislative boundary plans that have been approved, officially approved by the states um, or, or local entities, but will not take effect until their next election. Um, there are several states that had to do their redistricting very early because their election, their next election was very early. New Jersey is an example of this. Um, they, they have released their plans. Um, they will be in effect fairly soon. This second boundary set that I'm referring to is not, um, it has not, is not full coverage of the United States yet, but we add to it as those plans become available. So for instance, if you are in a particular state, say New Jersey, um, those plans have been approved. Um, we have them. We've incorporated them into our lookup tool. And you will be able to match your constituents to both current boundaries, uh, current districts, as well as the districts they will belong to um, when, the new, when the new legislature takes, takes effect. Um, that is, uh, again, that is useful to people for a number of reasons, um, depending on the types of actions you're taking. Now, the big question that um, a lot of people ask is, so what exactly is an API? Um, this is a little bit of tech speak, um, but an API is an application programming interface. Um, this means that there, it's basically a simple language used by one program, so your CRM or your database, um, to communicate across the web with another web-based program, which in this case is, the, is our Cicero database. Um, this very simple language enables software developers to design tools to, that are powered by data hosted elsewhere. So this basically takes the responsibility of hosting this huge database of information, maintaining it, updating all of the elected officials, um, off of you as the consumer and, um, or as the organization using the tool, and puts it on us. We host the service, and, and we can quickly and easily, um, almost, almost instantaneously, serve up this information to you as soon as you make an API call or hit. These are terms that are used interchangeably, basically meaning you, you tap us on the shoulder and ask us for the information through the API. Um, people use these, uh, the, the API to interface with a number of different applications. And API language is, is designed to communicate very simply with a wide variety of pieces of software. So it's not limited to communicating only with, your, say, your website, your organization's website, or only with your organization's CRM. Um, but if you are, using a, you are using any other type of software that is storing this information, um, it's most likely that um, you will be able to communicate via the API with our database. I have a very simple infographic that does a better job of explaining this visually. Um, basically, as you can see here, number one says, your application sends a request to us for districts, officials, or map images. It goes through the cloud. A cloud is another catchphrase, kind of a very uh, popular phrase at this point that a lot of people that you may be hearing about um, basically means that all of this information is stored on the web somewhere in, in kind of a cloud infrastructure of, of servers. Um, so everything is stored and, but accessible to you. We make it accessible to you via these calls to, to our service. Um, it's then processed, geocoded, processed through all of the elected official information, and we send it back to your application without, 
without you organizing anything on your end. As soon as the API is integrated, um, your software developer has integrated this into your system, um, you can hit a button and it will return information to you. The next piece um, is a question that we get fairly frequently as well. Um, who can integrate an API? How difficult, uh, what level of technical expertise does somebody need in order to, to use an API? There are a couple questions I usually ask people. Um, if you're comfortable using a command line, if you know what it is and are comfortable using a command line, um, you will most likely be able to integrate an API into um, your software. Um, the second question, have you ever used an API before? Are you familiar with them? Um, and most, most software developers or web designers um, have used APIs before. They're very, very common. They're becoming, they're becoming much more common um, as a way to communicate and access different, um, their different ser web services. And the third question, do you have some software programming knowledge? Again, you don't have to be um, a rock star software developer, somebody who can develop complex software. It's a pretty simple language, but you do have to have the basic tenets of software programming um, kind of understand them. If you don't have, if you don't meet these uh, requirements or, or can't answer yes to these questions, then uh, there are a couple people, uh, I know a number of our um, partners and clients have used, have used a number of different resources in order to integrate the API one time, and then they don't need to use, use that, those resources again after it's been implemented. Um, we have several people who have used their web designer. Um, advanced web designers would be able to integrate this into your website. Um, also software developers, if you have somebody on your staff or if you, um, there are a lot of freelance uh, contracted software developers um, and who would, be, who would take on a project that would be kind of a one-time project to set up an API um, and have it and make sure it's ready and running for you. And then you can continue to use it. A uh, final question, what, would, what can your organization actually do with Cicero? So there are, um, there are a plethora of ways to use the Cicero data, and we actually have a really impressive array of, of um, those uses in our client base. Um, I really like hearing stories about how people are actually using the data, and um, it really surprises me sometimes, ways that I wouldn't have actually anticipated um, the, the data being used. The first um, is probably the most obvious. On your website, I'm sure um, many of you have encountered lookup tools before where you type your address in and you get results. Um, whether it's you type your address in and you get the closest uh, pizza place to that address, or you type your address in and you get some other type of information back. Um, I've been to many advocacy websites that request your address or your zip code. Um, in order to give you back information about who, re who represents you, who represents your address. Um, we have a number of different use cases for this that I wanted to highlight one of our partners who has used, has used the API this way. Um, the first the, it's, is a project of actually of Common Cause Pennsylvania. Um, Common Cause PA has uh, developed this website called Our Philadelphia, and it's, you can go to it at ourphiladelphia.org. Um, it's a website that they wanted to create to provide Philadelphians, um, and actually it goes a little bit beyond Philadelphia to the region, um, provide people access to information and resources necessary um, to create an open, honest, uh, accountable local government that serves the public interest. Um, they're very interested in being able to enable people to find information that they may not have easy access to otherwise, or they'd have to dig, dig for a little bit, um, and make it, uh, make it available in the it kind of as soon as you can click the mouse when you enter your address. Um, so this first screen shows the address entry tool and all of the information that people get back. Now it, you see there are a lot of officials here in Philadelphia. We have a number of at-large representatives as well as, um, as, well as um, district level representatives. The second screen shows an example of some of the input that they, that our Philadelphia has, has um, incorporated into their app. So as you can see, you've gotten the information back. Um, this, you've also, you can see a small map with a map image of the district um, for this particular person. Um, the very nice thing as well is that they have integrated with other APIs on um, information that we at, this, at the Cicero API don't actually provide. So for instance, you can see on the right-hand side there's a section called Bills Sponsored. 
that actually is using a separate API that accesses, based on the district or the person's ID, um, all of the bills that they have sponsored in the past. So the very nice thing about APIs is that you can use multiple APIs in one application to kind of build a customized, um, a customized tool that you want that really meets your very specific needs for your organization. Um, a second way that uh, this, was, this was a great story when I heard it, I was very excited that somebody was using the API this way, um, is to disseminate news by district. So we um, got a request from the Oregonian, which is a, a, which is a local newspaper that serves the greater metropolitan um, Portland area in Washington, um, sorry, Washington. Um, Oregon, <laughs> the Oregonian, sorry about that. Um, so they have a tool in which they wanted to actually get their news, um, kind of filter it down based on a number of different, a number of different APIs. Um, the first API is the Cicero API that they're using. And as you can see here, you enter your street address in your city, and you find your representatives. Now, those representatives in their news articles are tagged um, with the name and the district ID. So then the person gets, that, gets the results back um, from after having looked up their representatives, and they are able to, um, they are able to filter by, based on news. So they get a news feed, um, only uh, news articles that are tagged with their representative's ID. Um, the same goes for tracking a bill. And if you actually go to the site, gov.oregonlive.com, you'll see that they have, they have quite a few options for political, and for political articles, um, different ways to look them up. A third way um, you can use an API or use the information that you get back from Cicero is to create website mashups. And this, um, this kind of goes back to what I'm saying about using multiple resources, multiple sources of information in one application. One thing that we've done internally is um, create a website called Redistricting the Nation. We do a lot of work around redistricting information. We have, because of the Cicero API, we have a lot of really great information, great spatial data, um, legislative districts, these kinds of things. And we've been able to use those districts to do further analysis around redistricting. Um, how compact is a district? How gerrymandered is a district? Um, we use the Cicero API for our website to provide a lookup for a lookup tool for people to find their districts, they can then do further analysis using another data set that we have in house that we developed in house um, to analyze that particular district and see how compact it is, um, and to learn a bit more about the actual boundaries of the district that they live in. And another way you can use um, the Cicero API is to integrate it with your database. Um, a lot of people manage their constituents or their members in, in an internal CRM um, contact, uh, contact management database. Um, I have a screenshot here of the, what we use internally, which is Salesforce, and this may be familiar to many of you. Um, you can um, integrate into many of these CRMs. They have different uh, plugins that you can use to integrate with APIs. Um, and you could potentially add fields to, your, to each contact or each lead and, um, that, are, that represent the districts that belong to that particular address. A uh, final um, discussion I'd like, to, I'd like to cover is how you can use this for your advocacy. Um, you can use it. It doesn't have to be web-based. After you've made the calls across the web to the Cicero Web Services, you have that information in hand. You can then take that information and create, um, create additional reports, reporting, maps. Um, I'd like to just emphasize a couple of these uh, maps that we have created or um, clients and partners of ours have created. Um, using the information that they are able to get to glean from the Cicero API. Um, the first is the Utility Emergency Services Fund. It's a local uh, um, organization that is, it's a nonprofit organization that assists low-income Philadelphians um, with emergency utility assistance. Um, they wanted to go to City Council and request more funding for their projects. They wanted to show City Council where in each district their, their recipients of their services lived. Um, these were useful tools for them. They actually printed the maps out um, and had a huge display for City Council. Um, and several City Council members commented on how, in, how much of an impact that visualization actually had on their decision-making process. 
um, they were able to, say, to show exactly how effective their outreach was, um, which districts were covered, which districts were not, and um, kind of draw some additional conclusions about, about their services that they may not have been able to do without the visualization. Um, additionally, we worked with the Wilma Theater and locally in Philadelphia, and again, we used the Cicero API to stamp all of, the, all of their constituents' addresses um, and figure out which zip codes they belonged to. Um, this enabled them to kind of profile who their, who their typical attendees were to their, to their performances, and then find using census data um, and several other databases that they had access to, um, kind of figure out where those that a, same, a similar profile type lived in the city and conduct their outreach, um, their outreach for future events based on that information that they got back from these maps. Um, the third and final report I wanted to show you, um, these, uh, we worked with maplight.org and opensecrets.org, um, both good government watchdog groups, to do an analysis of um, campaign contributions from outside of, of a particular person's district. Um, and they, we used the Citroen API, we geocoded all of the campaign contribution addresses, and were able to then figure out the ratio of in-district in versus um, outside remote um, locations for um, campaign contributions. Just a couple examples of how this information can be used kind of as a one-off for one-off projects, for analysis projects, projects that give you a little bit of a better understanding of your actual constituents or members of your organization, um, or projects that really help some convince people um, or show people, illustrate to people where you are, where your organization is doing a lot of work and having a really big impact. At this point, I would love to open up, um, open it up for any questions anybody has. Um, Kyla, do you want to take over at this point? Sure. Um, we did have one question that came in a while ago, so I'll go ahead and read that. But um, anybody who has questions, please type them into the chat pane, and I can read them to Abby. Um, and after Thomas's uh, section as well, we'll be opening it up for questions again. So Abby J had asked, can you tell us what your source for the reference address data is? And he's saying he assumes it's some commercial source. But from what my understanding is, it's really just the organization's uh, source that they're putting it in. Um, so I, I'll address a couple of things. I'm not sure exactly what that is, question is asking. Um, you, the addresses that you pass into the database, into the, I'm sorry, into the API are your own. Um, the way we are, geo, the geocoding service we are using is a commercial geocoding service. Um, it is it's something that is, we've vetted it. It's one of our business partners actually, um, and they are kind of the premier um, mapping and geocoding um, resource out there. Uh, their name is Esri. Um, they have one of the most up-to-date geocoders. They keep all of their information um, extremely up-to-date. So for instance, if, there is a, if in a particular neighborhood there is a new development, um, oftentimes that new development won't make it, make it to mapping services right away. Um, so if you have an, a member um, that lives in that new development, um, and they, you go to geocode their address, and it won't give you it won't give you a result because there is no address listed there. Um, Esri does a really good job of keeping up to date with that. Um, there are always there are always kind of random hiccups um, related to that kind of thing as map data changes. But um, we really we very much um, would think that this is probably one of the best geocoders out there. Um, so that gives you really good results. Um, and then I, I hope that answered the question. I'm not entirely sure if um, you were asking about address service in relation to geocoding. No, I think that totally answered the question. Right. Um, and I was, always, I was also wondering, I mean, this is just something that I, I wonder every time that a um, organization is stamping their own um, databases addresses, is if there's any privacy concerns, if anybody has ever brought that up. Um, I'm assuming not but I'm, I was just wondering if you've ever heard of, ever, sure. ever heard of anything like that. Absolutely. So um, when, you are, when you are passing, we don't store any of the address information that you pass to us. Um, so you're basically hitting the geocoder, it's giving you back information, but we don't store that internally. So that information um, 
isn't sitting around somewhere. Um, the only time we also do batch geocoding, um, which is kind of does not use does not use the API as integrated as you've integrated it with your with your software. Um, there are organizations that don't necessarily want to integrate the API. They just want a one-time project. Um, and in that case, they will pass us an Excel document or some other database format um, with all of their addresses. So they will actually mail that, email that to me or mail that in to me on, in, a, in whatever format they feel comfortable with. We will then process it in-house, um, stamp it with the coordinate points, and as well as um, the districts and any district information they want or elected inf information they want, and pass it back to them. Um, that, as some people have asked about security with that. We go to great lengths to get rid of all of the, all of the remaining um, kind of databases and, and database stamping that we do. Um, and we do have privacy um, and terms of use agreements that we can sign as well um, when it comes to, to keeping those addresses private. Okay, great. Um, Ivy asks, can you talk more about work using Cicero and school districts? Sure. So um, a couple people have been very interested in stamping their information with school districts um, only because, so one example is um, an education advocacy group in Pennsylvania is um, actually using it to, to do actions around um, school redistricting. So um, if they want, they can then stamp all of their members um, with the school districts they belong to. And then they are able to uh, decipher which members actually belong to a particular school district that they're doing an action around. I, I'm really interested in kind of hearing what people, what people think it could be used for, um, what this kind of non-legislative information, particularly school districts, um, could be used for. I think there are a lot of ways of using it to both segment your, um, segment your constituents by school district, but also do um, kind of analysis of where resources are going, um, uh, maybe stamping a grants database, grant recipient database with school districts as well to kind of see where grants are going or um, do that kind of analysis. I think it would be very interesting. Okay, great. Um, with that, I think we'll go ahead and get to Thomas. I believe he's back on the line and his phone had dropped. I will unmute him one more time. So Thomas, just give me one second. Nope, I'm here. Great. Here, here. Thanks very much. Thank no problem. Um, so I work with the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance, and um, we approached um, Azavia a number of years ago when we were trying to solve um, a problem that we'd been working on for a while, which was how t we could um, do online advocacy like so many organizations do, um, but target it at our local officials. The Cultural Alliance um, is an organization that has um, over 400 uh, member organizations, arts and culture presenters in our region, um, and we provide membership services. We provide uh, advocacy and research um, for the sector, and then we also do some collaborative marketing and uh, professional marketing development for our member institutions. But this was really around our advocacy and research efforts. In Philadelphia, like um, some but not all municipalities in the U.S., we have um, actual legislative districts within the city of Philadelphia, and this is a map of, of what it looks like. So we wanted to be able to, just as you know, when you're using one of the advocacy tools like um, Democracy in Action Salsa or Convio or uh, Blue State Digital, or there's a few others, um, you can, you know, people can log in there. They can. Uh, give their address and they'll be matched to the correct legislators. Um, we wanted to be able to do that for our city council people. And I would talk to various vendors and they would say, yes, we have local data, absolutely. And then it would turn out that what they meant was um, somebody could log in and get a list of all the city council people in Philadelphia, but they couldn't be matched to um, a specific district. And um, often that data was of pretty poor, poor quality anyway. So um, Azavia had done some work actually for the city of Philadelphia um, to build some uh, mapping applications. And so they had the know-how and the information. And so we worked with them to um, 
so we worked with them to build a service that we then uh, integrated with uh, the Get Active advocacy software. So we they built the API, and then we worked with Get Active um, to incorporate the API into their online advocacy product. Um, Get Active was subsequently acquired by uh, Convio, and we've now switched over to Democracy in Action Salsa, and again, worked with Democracy in Action uh, to integrate the Cicero API into um, their product. And it's actually uh, now available, they've made that available to all Democracy in Action um, Salsa subscribers. You can choose um, inside of Salsa. I think you probably have to contact the folks at uh, what's now called Salsa Labs to get that turned on. But you can choose to use um, Cicero data and Cicero uh, legislative data matching for your, uh, for your constituents. Um, so that's the main thing that we've been doing with this, with this, uh, with the Cicero API is driving folks to contact the correct uh, city council legislators when we've needed to call them to action around um, funding issues, um, other cultural uh, asset issues uh, in, our, in our region. But we also, on behalf of our uh, member institutions, do research and advocacy, sometimes very specific to that organization. And so this is um, a sample of a piece of work that we did for one of our member organizations. Um, ArtReach uh, is a local organization that um, brings together uh, social service organizations that um, serve uh, impoverished and uh, physically disabled um, clients, and they uh, help provide those help those service organizations um, provide access to arts and culture um, to their clients. And so they were meeting with legislators to and wanted to be able to demonstrate their impact and so we were able to uh, get from uh, from ArtReach a list a, a mixed list of the arts groups that they work with and the social service groups that they work with and put it all on one map that they could then share with uh, with the legislators that they were meeting with and this is a specific map that we developed for uh, one of the US congressional districts that um, covers uh, uh, about half of Philadelphia and a little bit of the suburbs. So that was, uh, so that's been a great uh, advantage to working with the Cicero API. And then sort of generally, it's just been, uh, we've been really fortunate to have um, Cicero and Azavia in the region. Um, what Cicero, what, what Azavia did was they took our very sort of narrow use case for Philadelphia and having built the surface just um, having built the service just uh, generalized it and added tons more data to it that made it so much useful so much more useful to so many other organizations and so uh, that's um, really been amazing to see how they um, took this little idea and, and made it so successful for themselves and for so many other organizations. So one of the projects that they were uh, actively involved with that, that I wanted to highlight that sort of uh, um, demonstrates their value to the, to the community is the fixphillydistricts.com. We were, um, as you know, we're, we're, we're in redistricting season and one of the first things that um, came out after the um, after they started looking at all this legislative district information was, um, you know, there's some really badly uh, gerrymandered districts. Oh, sorry, I went to the wrong slide there. There's some really badly gerrymandered districts um, in the country, but as it turns out, especially in Philadelphia, <laughs> they actually developed an algorithm that um, scores legislative districts um, for their um, for how gerrymandered they are based on compactness and, and uh, con contiguity. And so um, they actually found that our seventh um, uh, city council district is the worst uh, gerrymandered district uh, in the whole United States. You can see that it um, includes a little bit of turf up here and then sneaks over along like one or two blocks and then blows up a whole whole lot here. 
and uh, correspondingly, the 5th district has all this whole section that sneaks up here and then gets another little bit of space up here. So um, uh, Fix Philly Districts was actually an open source project where people could work with the data, the, the, the census data, the map data, the, um, the ward data, and, tr and submit their own ideas for building um, a new set of city council districts uh, for Philadelphia. And um, it was an amazing example of civic engagement. And we actually got um, pretty good results. Um, th this is what the city council actually approved. It was one of the submitted maps. You can see that um, the 7th district and the 5th district looked like fairly respectable <laughs> uh, districts that are not um, drawn to satisfy somebody's uh, political will. So uh, that's, about, that's about all I had to say, but I'd be happy to answer any additional questions about how we've used Cicero or how you might use Cicero, or Abby can probably answer a lot of questions as well. Sure. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was really, really informative. Um, I, was, I was actually wondering when you were first starting out, did your constituents um, realize that they were getting more accurate data when you were trying to refer them to you know, specific legislative districts or representatives? Or is there, did you have a lot of, did you have any reaction? Um, I think that people were, um, I don't, I would say we probably didn't highlight that as, as much as we might have. I think that we, you know, we had this very specific goal in mind of um, wanting to match people to their legislators. And to some extent, I think, you know, I, I, w I was actually surprised at how difficult the problem turned out to be. I'm like, you know hey, we've got all these services that match people to their legislative districts. Why can't we just extend that to, um, to local districts? And um, it turns out that the problem was, was more difficult than I initially perceived. And, uh, you know, Xavier was the, was the folks who solved it, particularly with their approach to geocoding. Um, we specifically looked at the zip code problem. And even though, you know, some of these other services um, improve their matching by um, with zip plus four. Um, zip plus four it is a moving target. The Postal Service can, you know, move those plus four codes around sort of at will. It's, it's not intended to be a mapping tool. It's intended to be a postal delivery tool. And so the using the specific latitude, latitude and longitude based on somebody's address really is the way that um, you can get an accurate uh, match for districts, and uh, so we're, you know, glad that we're using the right data and directing people to the right legislator. Okay, great. Um, I did have a question that came in a little bit ago, and Thomas, you might be able to answer this, or Abby, you might be able to. Um, Jay asked, is there a limit to how many addresses I can submit through the API? For example, no more than a thousand addresses per day, or is there no limit? I can definitely answer that. Um, we don't we don't put um, a hard limit on your usage of the API. Um, as you can imagine, with any web service, there the more traffic we get, the more tasks the service is. We um, do have a very redundant um, system on the back end, which means um, that's a kind of tech speak for the fact that if if one if we get overburdened in one with uh, one service, we can kind of switch over to another. Um, we can, if you have a huge, we do say for organizations that want, that know they are going to be doing maybe millions of records um, in a very short time frame, we do ask that um, you give us a little bit of a heads up so we can potentially ramp up um, additional resources to ha handle that. But no, there is, um, we don't put any kind of hard and fast limit on you as far as how many a day you can do. Okay, great. And just for everybody's knowledge, I'm going to go ahead and put into the chat pane the um, bit.ly to the Cicero API legislative matching um, uh, on TechSoup stock, so people can access that there. Um, so if anybody has any questions, again, please type them into the chat pane because we will be around for a couple more uh, minutes answering questions. One thing that's really struck me uh, hearing Thomas's story and you know, Abby, hearing you talk about Azavia's work is that Azavia seems pretty open to working with nonprofits. Um, if a nonprofit had a specific request, or I guess this could go to Thomas too, how exactly did you go about approaching Azavia? 
Sure. So I, I mean, Azavia is has definitely um, found a, um, a niche um, in Philadelphia, and and you know they're they're a um, consultant and software provider to a number of of nonprofits. So um, you know they they're not going to work for free, but uh, you know they're they're donating the these credits, um, you know, five thousand per organization through the through TechSoup stock, but. Uh, I'm sure that Abby would uh, be happy to entertain additional uh, conversations about about ways that uh, Azavia, either through uh, on projects that either uh, involve the Cicero API or other um, geospatial um, projects that that might uh, help your organization. Um, her colleagues at uh, Azavia have been incredibly generous. Uh, the, uh, Robert, the founder, has come and spoken at um, our local uh, Philly Net Squared, which is a affiliated project of TechSoup um, Group, um, a couple of times and attended others. And um, her colleague Jeremy has been there, and I think Abby's been there herself a couple of times. So they're they're very engaged in what's going on, um, both technologically and in the nonprofit sector in our region. And uh, one thing I would like to add to that, we very we work with nonprofits often to uh, one thing we do to kind of be able to work with nonprofits on very interesting projects. It's kind of what drives us um, as as an organization is to get these projects using data that people may have um, in on hand and have a really uh, great concept for something that they want to do um, with their with their address based or geographic data that they have. Um, so we have worked with quite a few people to write grants for funding for these projects. Um, we have a grant writer on staff, that, uh, and we will, we will absolutely work with people to write the technical portion of those, those kinds of grants as well. Um, so yes, we are, we are driven by, uh, by the content of the project, and we, we very much um, anticipate and look forward to um, working with nonprofits on, um, on interesting, interesting projects around their data. Okay, great. Thank you, Abby. Um, one thing that I was I was uh, just wondering because I come from a library background, and I was just curious as to whether or not you um, specifically, because Abby had heard of any libraries who had used this API. Because I'm just thinking of with a lot of the funding being cut for libraries, that this might be a powerful source for them as well. Sure. Um, we, this actually just came up this week. Um, we don't currently have um, any clients that are that are libraries, um, though we have a number of libraries who have who I've talked to um, who we're working with on other projects who will direct people to the Cicero, the free Cicero Live um, tool that is basically just a sample that shows you how to look up an address and get information back. Um, it is a, it's a good resource um, kind of for individuals to look up um, issues. We um, or uh, look up districts. Sorry, we um, we would love to also again entertain any ideas that that libraries have around these resources. Um, the spatial data lookups, so the the actual map information that we gather by hand, is not widely available in one place. So we we spend a lot of time looking for that information. Um, and university libraries have a lot of information based on. Uh, a lot of geographic information often um, for for their geographic region, but not necessarily um, for the rest of the U.S. And um, the the great thing about working um, on this has been using library resources, um, working with libraries to get this information, universities as well to get this information, this spatial information for the Cicero API. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I haven't seen any additional questions come in, but if anybody does think of any questions after the fact you can contact uh, both Abby and Thomas, and their contact information is on your screen right now, and I will also be sending it out in the follow-up message. So again, thank you so much, Abby and Thomas, for providing this presentation today. It's been really, really great. Um, and just a little bit to wrap it, wrap it up, a little bit about TechSoup. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization, like many of you, and we do attempt to provide technology and technology resources to nonprofits and libraries throughout the world. And our mission statement, TechSoup is part of TechSoup Global. 
which is working towards a day when every nonprofit, library, and social benefit organization on the planet has the technology, knowledge, and resources they need to operate at their full potential. And of course, part of our mission in providing technology and technology resources, you can go to TechSoup.org to find out more information on this, these technology resources by going to the Learning Center or the blog, or you can go to find products over here. And don't forget that we do have TechSoup newsletters by the Cup and new product alert. And if you want to go ahead and sign up for those, you can go to TechSoup.org and enter your email address in there. And I do want to go ahead and thank ReadyTalk, which is our webinar sponsor for this event. So thank you very much for all of your wonderful support. And just as one final reminder, we will be having a webinar next week, December 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific Time on training an invisible audience, delivering effective webinars. And the presenters will be myself, which is Kyla Hunt, and Stephanie Gerding, who is a professional librarian and trainer. So again, thank you, Abby. Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, John, for being on the chat. And thank you, everybody, for attending today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Please stand by.